So with the release of a new set of Ubuntu distributions, I upgraded my main machine from 17.04 to 17.10. So how I did it this time around was a complete nuke and pave. I uh, completely reformatted all of my drives and then restored the documents themselves that I keep on my home partition from backup, which meant that I didn't carry over any or at least very few of the config files. And the reason I do this is because whenever there's a new version of the Ubuntu uh, variants, or Ubuntu itself of course, they often make a lot of changes which sometimes get phased out if you import over your entire home directory. That includes all of your config files and everything that makes your system different from the vanilla basic install that you get right out of the box. So I've always felt that enjoying a distribution or making the most of the new features of a distribution can really only come at the hands of uh, seeing it anew, seeing it how other people would uh, approach it for the first time in many ways. I also feel that it gives a much better... Um, well-rounded uh, view of it so that I can then sort of talk about it on camera and so forth. However, there are lots of different ways to upgrade and I'm going to talk a little bit about the upgrading process and also about the release cycles of not just the Ubuntu distributions but other distributions as well. Because it's kind of got me thinking now that the next release of the Ubuntu desktops is going to be the long-term support release. So for those of you that don't know what the long-term support release is and why some Ubuntu distributions have LTS after their name, that of course stands for the long-term support, uh, I'm just going to explain it briefly now. So usually Ubuntu and their official variants release their distributions once every six months. Um, and every two years, so that's one of every every fourth distribution, uh, one of these distributions is usually given the long-term support status, and it's usually the April release, the 04. That's why all the LTSs tend to have, uh, you know, tend to be 04 distributions. And the biggest difference between the LTS versions and the non-LTS versions is that they are supported, particularly with security updates, for a much longer period of time, usually five years, although I have seen other uh, spin-offs and variants only go as far as three years, depending on where you go and, and, and what the situation is. And I've even at one point uh, noticed that Kubuntu, the KDE version of Ubuntu, actually for, foregone or forewent a uh, LTS status because they didn't feel that that version of KDE was able to be supported or stable enough to be supported for the long term. So it's only a general rule and there are certainly exceptions from time to time, but generally speaking, you can accept that a long-term support release has five years of maintenance behind it. Now, some people will tell you that an LTS version is more stable than the six monthly release. And there's only a half truth to this because Ubuntu and Canonical, certainly when they're developing vanilla Ubuntu, will uh, make an effort that the two yearly, the long-term support release versions, are stable enough that they can be supported long into the future. But in a lot of cases, this is, is, is kind of impossible because you've really only got basically the latest or a very recent version of software that you're working with, and it's down to support and plugging the holes as they arise uh, that you can really do this. So in, in many cases, uh, if you want the most stable and secure of systems, going um, and upgrading every six months rather than, say, every two years for the long-term support might even be uh, more viable because at least every six months you get a whole new set of repositories with updated versions of software, which means that any bugs or holes that have arisen um, between now and the last six months could very well have been upgraded or fixed or patched out or whatever. And that's, of course, not counting the uh, obvious patches that you get from time to time. However, even though really officially speaking, the only difference between long-term support and non-long-term support is just the amount of um, support it gets going into the future, uh, the distributions themselves or the people maintaining them will often take this into account and they will often take, shall we say, fewer risks or make more riskier um, prepara uh, preparations when it comes to the six monthly releases over the long-term support release. A good example of this is Ubuntu going with the GNOME desktop. So obviously they've been using the Unity desktop for a couple of years now and they've decided to go back to the GNOME desktop. Now, they could very well have done this on a long-term support release. However, they seemingly decided to do uh, to do this uh, six months before a long-term support release so that they can actually um, 
a, make it act as a, a sort of a pseudo beta. Obviously, this is a release candidate suitable for use on production machines that run six monthly builds. However, because uh, the next long term support is going to be used long into the future and will be, uh, you know, and anything that goes wrong with it will be present in a lot of people's minds for a lot longer. They probably want to put the GNOME desktop through a dry, a dry run where the most enthusiastic of its user base will be able to battle test it before it goes out to a much larger mass market. So it certainly makes a lot of sense in that regards. And if you guys have seen my review of the Ubuntu distribution, you will know that I certainly have mixed feelings about some of the UI decisions that they've made. Uh, most notably that there seems to be a rather large or a large number of ways of doing things. What I mean by that is um, there seems like there are, if you there are multiple ways of doing what are seemingly basic tasks, and this doesn't seem necessarily intuitive to UI in general. Whereas with your traditional, say, Windows-esque layout, you've got a simple start menu, and you've got tasks, and it's all lined up at the bottom in a single taskbar. And to be honest, I think that's really the height of UI, if I'm going to be so bold as to say that. I think we got it right with Windows... Well, we kind of got the idea right with Windows 95, and then sort of perfected it with, you know, up until, say, Windows, Windows 7, I guess guess. Um, and really, you know, I, I feel that is, in terms of a standard desktop layout, you can't really do much better than that. And I think when desktop environments try and deviate from it, um, a lot of people will look to the bottom left hand corner for a start menu, especially converts from Windows. But it also seems to be a wider default for a lot of for the general desktop paradigm as well. So um, it's, that's not necessarily to say that the standard layout for the Mate desktop, which was of course once the GNOME 2 desktop, is counterintuitive. My first distribution was, I think it was like Fedora 6, Fedora 7, around that, or my first distribution that I used as my primary main full-time distribution, um, and I found that very intuitive. Uh, even though it was a very different layout to the Windows desktop. So that's not necessarily to say that the Redmond layout, as it's often been referred to, is the only way of doing it. But the fact that it offers that f uh, level of familiarity and consistency, I think a lot of people overlook that. It, that, that Im that's the importance of that. So anyway, in terms of upgrading and in terms of choosing your distribution, uh, I am facing a conundrum, or I will be facing a conundrum in six months' time. Now, the machine I've got right here is my production machine, and I haven't generally considered it a machine for testing distributions. And it's only recently that I've really started to, um, to make use of this as a distribution testing machine as well as a production rig. In fact, I bought this Entraware laptop right next to it specifically for the purposes of a laptop or a, or a machine that would actually be used not only in day-to-day -day production, because I do use it in day-to-day -day production, but I could also freely reinstall distributions on top of it and actually learn how they use on a, in you know day in and day out. So I've got to think now, with the next long-term support release of Ubuntu coming down the line, that doesn't just mean a new long-term support of Ubuntu. It also means uh, that a lot more distributions are going to be coming out as well. For example, even though Linux Mint has a approximately a six monthly release cycle as well, and it usually comes out a few weeks, maybe a month or so after uh, Ubuntu itself, the uh, Linux Mint distribution is based on the last long-term support of Ubuntu. The same also applies to elementary OS and a large number of other Ubuntu-based OSs. So I've got to um, I've got to sort of think about now, do I want for this machine to have a long-term support, a distribution that I can use uh, for a couple of years without having to worry about um, reformatting it? Do I carry on updating every six months? Because I've got to admit here now, having just updated and now it's running... It was it's running Ubuntu Mate seventeen ten, but I did actually stick on Zubuntu seventeen ten beforehand just to see if there was anything it offered that Ubuntu Mate can't. And um, I'll probably be doing a separate video just glancing over some of the distributions that I've had a brief look at, but not taken enough time to give a full review. And I gotta say, with Zubuntu, well, 
Let's put it this way, you kind of know what you get. If you're familiar with the XFCE desktop and you're familiar with the uh, the underlying framework of Ubuntu, you're going to get one on top of the other. Um, with Ubuntu Mate, there is actually a lot more effort gone into the end user experience, uh, the software boutique, for example, um, the different desktop paradigms and how to, to change them and customize them and sort them out and the Mate tweak tool. It's all really, it's a fine distribution from top to bottom. And it also hits home a lot that the difference in um, in uh, the Ubuntu variants, like it, it, an Ubuntu variant, isn't just a desktop environment on top of the Ubuntu base. Um, in, well, in in Zubuntu's case, it is. But in the case of, for example, Ubuntu Mate, a lot more work has gone into the end user experience. And I certainly would be more comfortable recommending Ubuntu Mate to new users to Linux and new users to Ubuntu than I would be with uh, with Zubuntu or, you know, maybe Lubuntu. But Lubuntu is quite a minimalist desktop in um in its own right and therefore there's not too much that can go wrong and I have put new users onto Lubuntu before with uh, you know a great deal of satisfaction on their part so um, it, it depends like it depends on the um, on the distribution in question another thing that's also worth bearing in mind is that different uh, distributions have different communities around them as well so um, you know some distributions will focus more on providing support through social media forums whereas uh, for example other distributions like so shall we say Ubuntu Mate will have a dedicated forum which I think is ubuntu-mate.community I think it, that's that's only off the top of my, my head so I could be wrong on that one where it provides a full fleshed out community forum that allows for support there so it depends. Different distributions have different ethoses and ways of doing things. And that, again, is something that, that should be considered. So Ubuntu Mate from top to bottom, i got to say, is generally something that I recommend. And from the people uh, who I talk to on social media, particularly Mastodon now these days, uh, I, I seem to be around a lot of people who, who, who think the same thing. So the question I've really got to ask myself is, if I go for the long-term support release of Ubuntu or an Ubuntu-based distribution, Am I going to stick with LTS? Now, some of you guys uh, may be expecting uh, or may actually uh, want to suggest that I go with like a rolling release, as I have done in the past. I've used Manjaro on this machine before and with a great deal of success. Manjaro is a it's pretty much a rolling release. Now, a rolling release means that soft, new software gets updated in the repositories as it becomes available. So contrasting to the long-term support release where you just get a new whack of software every two years, and of course that doesn't apply to all of your software. For example, uh, your web browser will be updated throughout um, your Ubuntu release, regardless of whether or not you're on a long-term support or not, because I guess a browser is considered security um, a security issue? I certainly th I would call it that as well. And it's also a particularly prominent piece of software, so if it can be done, it should be done. But generally speaking, with software across the board, with an LTS release, um, what you get is what you're stuck with for at least two years until the next one comes out. Whereas with Manjaro, for example, you get new software as it becomes available or shortly after it goes through the testing process. Um, and I've had a great deal of success with that model as well. Now, admittedly, more issues and bugs and conflicts come up from time to time. However, the benefit of doing the, uh, or applying this through a rolling release model is that the issues come up one by one, you know, as the software becomes available, the issues then rise up as a result of that particular software upgrade usually. Uh, and that allows you to deal with issues in small chunks, as it were, um, as they arise, which is a lot more manageable and a lot less stressful than actually having to update a six monthly release and then dealing with um, a huge shift uh, all at once. Although truth be told, the upgrade upgrading through Mate has been pretty painless as well. Um, it's There's been like some things to... Um, to set up and there has been a degree of setting up process but that's a lot of it is down to me just nuking and paving the entire hard drive whereas you would never really do that with Manjaro because it is just a, a rolling release. Now with long-term support releases uh, particularly with Ubuntu or, or Linux Mint uh, one of the real benefits is the stability. Now it's not necessarily like I said earlier that the stability of a two-year or a long-term support release is inherently more stable. It's not like the software included included with it is for some reason more stable than than others. It's just that once you've fixed a bug or once you've fixed an error or once you've set something right, you then don't have to come back to that till at least two years in which you would hope that that issue may have been resolved or fixed or you know 
however the issue that you imagine would be resolved. So it does allow for a slower moving system a long-term support does allow for a slower moving system, whereas a rolling release is a much faster moving system that is manageable because you're doing it as you go. And then the six monthly release is a, it, it is the medium ground between the two. Now, I've not actually tried uh, Ubuntu's upgrade process, but I'm told it, get, it becomes better and uh, more improved and more stable uh, every single time. However, what you can do and what I choose to do is to have my home partition on an entirely separate hard drive than my... Uh, my root partition so that I can completely wipe and put on a new uh, operating system. It doesn't necessarily have to be Ubuntu based, it could be anything, and I still have all of my files on my, my home partition as well. Um, so this means that nuking and paving is purely optional even when things go pretty horrifically wrong in an upgrade process or just through doing something uh, silly, I guess. So First off, I'd like to ask you guys what your upgrade procedure is. Do you completely new and pave? Do you save your config files? Um, or do you save a specific amount of number of config files? I know that because I often use VPNs and, and this and that, um, my um, version of Redshift gets a little bit confused when it comes to um, my location and therefore finding sunset and sunrise times. So I've actually just specified uh, a specific latitude and longitude that I want Redshift to, to work around. Um, so I do keep that config file, um, you know, off to the side so that I can call upon it when needed. And there are a few other applications for similar reasons that I keep the config files around because sometimes you just need to set something using unorthodox settings. But for the most part, I do like a complete new can pave. For example, in um, it, with Ubuntu Mate, they may set up new desktop paradigms or there may be, um, you know, there may be something built into the desktop that a config file would then uh, phase out. And then I'd never know of a particular benefit. Also, it has caused the occasional issue as well. So I actually have to say that for the for the when the uh, when April or May comes around and the Ubuntu-based long-term support release distributions start coming coming out, I've been giving some thought to uh, li giving Linux Mint another go. Um, that is a distribution that, although is in many ways a reskin of Ubuntu, it uses a more traditional desktop paradigm, but also takes a lot of care and consideration to uh, out the out of the box experience, so that you could install it. On to a desktop and so much of it is pre-configured, uh, pre set up, um, and important pieces of software that are commonly used are pre-installed and so forth. And it was one of the earlier distributions that actually came with uh, like MP3 and MP4 video you know, and video codecs and, and DVD codecs that were available and pre-installed out of the box that actually um, piqued my interest. And in fact, actually the thing that pushed me over the edge as an original Linux Mint user uh, was that it supported widescreen monitors before Ubuntu did, which I thought was uh, was quite interesting there. And I've been having a look at the Cinnamon desktop, and I've got to say, I've been pretty impressed with it over the years. It certainly started out, uh, oh, it started out all right, and a lot in a lot of cases, um, uh, Lin um, the Cinnamon desktop on other distributions other than Linux Mint was pretty shaky, and it, it even had its moments on um, on Linux Mint in the early days. But nowadays. It's looking like a really, really good competitor to something like GNOME or Budgie. Budgie, of course, being really good as well. So um, it does seem that there are plenty of good desktop environments there. And, you know, w when I was looking over Zubuntu, i got to say, I mean, if you like XFCE, you've got XFCE. But it certainly looks like it's staying in its heyday. You know, it certainly looks like it's, 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 it's aging. Is basically that's what I'm saying. It seems to be aging a little bit. And if you're a bit of a traditionalist when it comes to the desktop, or if you like things particularly lightweight, then you're certainly going to get what you want there. But even with distributions like Lubuntu Next, which offer LXQT as their primary desktop, you know that's moving on while at the same time being pretty much as lightweight. So it'd be interesting to see um, how Zub or how XFCE uh, manages to keep up in the next generation of desktop environments, or whether or not it will have to give up the ghost in favor of things like Cinnamon, Mate, or the Budgie desktop, or even LXQT. Because even LXDE is is you know like LXQT is the answer to LXDE. There was a lot of concern that 
uh, when GT, the GTK toolkit came around, or GTK3 toolkit came around, that it wasn't just it wasn't lightweight enough that uh, a, a, um, a desktop environment like LXDE could could be satisfied by. So it did look to the Qt toolkit for something a bit more lightweight because with Qt, even though uh, the KDE desktop environment or Plasma as we should call it nowadays isn't known for being particularly lightweight. The toolkit itself, the Qt toolkit, over recent years, they've made efforts to make sure that it's much more modular and more uh, suitable for using on specific individual instances without having to download a whole wealth of libraries. And I've certainly found that to be the case these days as well. Qt seems to be quite a mobile and adaptable um, toolkit. And you see a lot of programs like, uh, I think... Uh, uh, I can't remember if Inkscape uses Qt, but I know that like um, VirtualBox uses Qt, Simple Screen Recorder uses Qt, uh, KeyPass X uses Qt. There are a lot of applications, Caden Live Q uses Qt, although that uses a lot more of the Plasma uh, framework and the Plasma desktop because it's, I guess it's such an advanced application. But there are a lot of applications out there that use Qt that a lot of people may not even consider because Qt now, of course, blends quite well with, with GTK, but is also very light and very nimble. So I think that they made quite a good... Um, um, I, I, you know, like obviously the jury is going to still be out until LXQT is uh, up in full, you know, up in full form. But it, things look really promising, and it looks like they could very well have made the decision that's that's best for them, I guess. There, but time will tell on that one. So anyway, as you can tell, this is certainly a rambly video. I must put rambling somewhere in the title just to just to outline that because um, I guess the uh, the options there, and of course I'm going to come back to Solus in regards to an upgrade uh, policy as well because Solus is again it's one of these um, mixed uh, ways of doing things. Solus is a rolling release in that new software is brought into the repositories as it becomes available, but every now and then they will. Um, make it so that you have to nuke and pave, you have to start a whole uh, new installation of their um, operating system so that you actually get the benefits uh, and that they can do a proper full upgrade of some of the lower level components that are a little bit risky to upgrade from distribution to distribution as a rolling release might. So in order to keep the, st the benefits of stability as well as the benefits um, of a rolling release, they've kind of got this model where it's a rolling release but you just have to reinstall from scratch every couple of years it seems. So um, a, a perhaps a more courageous LTS might be a way of putting it, or a or a um, a, a rolling release with uh, with a safety net. Uh, depends uh, depends how you want to look at it. But Solus, it's I mean it, it's a very promising distribution, and there is something weirdly squeamish about me using it as a as my primary. Um, operating system. There's no real reason why I shouldn't. It has all the software. It even has Snap support. But um, I guess in many cases it's the familiarity concept that's holding me back. I don't know. I'd really love to hear your thoughts on it because I think that Linux Mint does have its place. A lot of people do consider it to be an Ubuntu reskin, but there is more to a distribution than that. For example, the community support, uh, the software that is supported, and certainly in terms of the out-of-the-box support for software is important. Um, the, I mean, the the UI is particularly important as well. The Cinnamon UI is really, really, really good, and uh, they offer up two of the um, two desktops. They really only needed the one. I think that sometimes it can be a mistake, particularly among distributions that appeal to to new users, to offer up multiple desktops when a new user might not necessarily appreciate the nuance between one or the other. Um, but then again, that's just me and perhaps a conversation or a, to a video topic for another time. But um, I definitely have to say that I am leaning towards having a long-term support release uh, come, uh, well, come April. And, um, and I think it may be an Ubuntu variant or possibly uh, a Linux Mint, uh, a version of Linux Mint. Mm, I'm not ruling out elementary, but elementary is a desktop paradigm that I'm... It's, it's not one that particularly appeals to me right now, but um, it has its user base, so it's certainly doing something right somewhere. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm certainly giving it some thought, and I really would like your guys' thoughts down in the comment section below. Um, but the big issue with long-term support releases is twofold. The first being that after the end of the two years in the you know just before a new release comes out, software can look pretty ropey. And we have seen software on the Linux platform advance so much in the last two years. And I'm specifically thinking now as a YouTube content creator when we're looking at Caden Live 
OBS, even things like Simple Screen Recorder, all of this software, uh, and OBS, and, and um, Audacity's gotten a lot more stable as well. It used to have a lot more crashes. Nowadays, it seems to be able to work through anything. So we've definitely seen a big... Um, jump forward over the past couple of years in the quality of software on the Linux desktop. And I don't know if this is just as a result of, of time, you know, doing its thing or whether or not it's the Linux ecosystem that just has more developers than it used to or whether or not, yeah, like it's just um, software maturing and becoming more stable over time. But uh, whatever the reasons, um, it's definitely in a much better place And the last couple of years have seen a, a rather large amount of growth. So I don't want this feeling of being left behind by sort of pitching uh, my tent in a permanent place for the next two years and then watching this great software come about. The testing laptop is great for seeing what's what's about, but when it comes to actually uh, like uh, high level software, software that, that that needs a lot of processing power, needs a lot of graphic, you know, that, that requires a lot of graphical horsepower as well, this is the machine. My desktop is going to be the machine that tests that software. So then I guess that's the case for Manjaro, but... And I did have a lot of happy years on Manjaro, and I think the reason that... that um, that I did leave was just because I, I wanted to try out uh, Ubuntu Mate um, and see if the rock solid stability was um, the same on uh, other computers that I'd used it on as it would be on this. And it turns out, yeah, it is. Ubuntu Mate. Can't sing that distribution praises more highly enough. I mean, there's a great amount of Linux distributions out there, um, especially based on Ubuntu, but Ubuntu Mate. I've had the I've had the most number of people praise it uh, in my in my circles. Both both of you guys who I chat with on social media and also people whose uh, laptops I've installed it on. Um, and the fewest amount of negative, uh, the least amount of negative, you know, feedback from it. So it's definitely, and I can see why, you know, I'm, I'm using it day to day. I'm recording the audio for this video on the Ubuntu Mate uh, desktop now. So um, it definitely seems so. So um, I think the second issue what why i'm a bit trep um why i'm a bit worried about possibly uh signing on to a long term support release early on is that even though certain software can be updated regularly through uh third party ppas um a lot of it depends on the kind of software that it is as to how stable these these ppas can be i've had issues before where uh, a newer version of software then requires a newer uh um, a dependency and that dependency is then a shared dependency which means upgrading that dependency will then uh, mean that another piece of software that depends on it uh, will then have a, a mismatched version and then can cause issues down the line. This is particularly uh, prevalent with uh, video codecs and so forth. I'm thinking particularly of um, some rather severe issues that I had upgrading Caden Live, although that would be a bit of software that this wouldn't apply to. An example of like a third-party PPA that you'd be pretty safe installing and using would be the OpenMW uh, PPA that gives you the latest version of that. For those of you that don't know what OpenMW is, uh, it's this open source game engine that you can use to play uh, The Elder Scrolls Three Morrowind in. You can get it from OpenMW.org. It's well worth the download. It's absolutely amazing. I'm pretty sure it's available on Arch um, and pretty much most distributions as well. They make it pretty available and it allows you to play uh, The Elder Scrolls through Morrowind natively on most Linux distributions with even a few improvements including long distance, um, you know, like the, the long draw distance and, um, and a few others as well. It's also compatible with um, most, if not all, of the uh, Morrowind mods as well. So uh, it's got a lot going for it. And uh, I will be showcasing it on this channel more as the time moves on. Anyway, I've rambled on long enough. But yeah, like I say, out of all of the different possible upgrade procedures and how to um, manage a desktop PC, you know, long term, I certainly would like your guys' feedback on it. But I certainly do feel that there are a lot of benefits to having a long term support release because it allows you to deal with issues once and then not have to come back to them for at least two two years, which is which is quite good. There, it has this uh, degree of stability which I find really quite comfortable. Uh, but that being said. That, that rolling release on Manjaro, that's uh, that's pretty good as well. So I'd like to hear from your Manjaro users, the Manjaro users amongst you. Um, you know, how long have you had your install and how do you feel about it? Um, and if there's any other suggestions you might like to have or, or any sort of experiences that you'd like to share up, I certainly would love to hear from them, from you for 
you know what I mean. Share your experiences down in the comments section below. Just before I leave you, I wanted to do a quick follow-up to this video, an addendum or appendix, if you will, uh, because of course I forgot to talk about um, things like snaps and flat packs and all that other kind of stuff that might actually be able to bridge the gap between, first of all, a lot of uh, distributions of all different kinds of stripes, but particularly the likes of uh, Linux Mint and or Ubuntu long-term support releases uh, in terms of having a uh, very secure, very uh, stable software base, but for the occasional bit of software that comes along that I might want that's a bit newer and can run in its own environment, things like Sla uh, Snap and, and Flatpak and the like are almost perfect for this kind of thing. So. Uh, the reason that I sort of neglected to mention it is because of, as of thus far, I've actually come into a fair number of personal, pro not personal problems, problems uh, just on my own machine from my personal perspective, I guess is what I'm trying to say, when it comes to things like snaps. Now, they're very, very much in their early stages and, um, you know, problems with them are, are likely to, you know, to be worked out in due course. Um, so I guess that kind of, uh, you know, that's still in play, as it were, um, at the moment. Now, when it comes to, so should we say two years down the line, it might be a no-brainer and we, you know, it might be fine. Any software that I need, the latest and greatest software. In fact, it could very well be the norm that most software um, that isn't part of the base OS is packaged as a snap or a flat pack or whatever, uh, just because it's easier to distribute that uh, package across very, uh, you know, various platforms. And it'd be interesting to see how that changes the ecosystem. But I just wanted to put this addendum in because, like, sort of as of this moment. Uh, I am sort of considering it in, but most of the distributions that I'm considering either have access to the AUR, in which case anything I assume Snap related will also be, uh, be you know, it wouldn't be particularly difficult to, or, or Flatpak related, it wouldn't be particularly difficult to get it into the AUR, you know, repackaged into the AUR, or, um, or, or, or through any other means. Also, of course, um, most distributions now support Snaps or Flatpaks and... Um, and, and even, you know, I'm pretty sure Manjaro would probably support snaps as well. I'm, I'm As I'm quite aware, I think Arch does, so there's no reason why Manjaro wouldn't as well. Um, so it certainly seems that there's a lot of options in that regard. Also, one thing that I did forget to mention is that after uh, I'm settled in with this Ubuntu Mate install on my primary rig, I think what I'm going to do is something that I've nicknamed the LTS Challenge. I know this is incredibly dorky, so it would probably be sometime around the new year. I would actually take uh, Ubuntu Mint 17.10 off this machine and put an Ubuntu LTS from 16.04 on this machine. So that could be either Linux Mint or it could be uh, an Ubuntu Mate LTS, although I suppose that's a, that's not entirely necessary because uh, a few people... Basically, when I install Ubuntu Mate onto a friend or family member's laptop, I go to the LTS version because that requires the least amount of maintenance and provides the most amount of stability. And, um, I, you know, I'm not even entirely sure once the next LTS comes around whether or not they'll want to upgrade as well. They've settled into their distribution and their system in a way that they may very well be happy with and only want to upgrade once... I don't know, once, whenever they have to, really. So um, that, that, that'll be interesting, uh, an interesting bridge to, uh, to cross, and I'll certainly uh, consider their feedback on that. But yeah, uh, so basically what I want to do with the LTS challenge is install an LTS and see what it would look like from someone like my, my point of view um, when it comes to the end of its, not necessarily the end of its life cycle, but towards the end of, uh, or to the beginning of a new version of the LTS. So it would be the shortest possible time that I would have to live with an LTS would be two years. Um, and it would be interesting to see how ropey the software is, how out of date, how stable the software is, how far we've moved on and how far or how much an LTS has managed to, to keep up over time as well. So uh, that would also, uh, you know, I would look at how things like snaps and flat packs would, would be supported, whether or not their support has, has has caught up or carried on, or whether or not the base system in that regard has um, uh, has, has stayed where it is. So yeah, um, and I'll certainly rela relay that in a later video, but um, if you guys have any suggestions on what a LTS-based release I could use for that, I, w I was thinking possibly Linux Mint, um, just on the basis that... Um, 
that I haven't tried that out for quite some time, and it would be nice to see what it'd be like in production, but uh, it could very well be uh, an Ubuntu variant as well. I don't know, I haven't made my mind up yet, but I've got a few months to decide, I guess. Anyway, guys, thanks for watching, and uh, until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.